Welcome back. First off, wow, just wow. The amount of support I've had on these Five Nights at Freddy's retrospective videos is more than I could ever ask for, so thank you so much. All right, Five Nights at Freddy's 3. Let's get into it. Now, others have pointed out in the past, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was when the game hit its peak in hype. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's 3. This might be the most hyped game in the history of gaming. The thrilling conclusion, a new animatronic, so many unknowns. So let's start by looking at the teasers and the trailer. I mentioned in the last video that Scott's website turned offline after the release of Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Well, there was a little something more than that. Yet again, we're back to brighten the image. Until next time. Well, that time came pretty soon after. File name FNAF 3. I am still here. And the reveal of a new character. There were people who thought this was Golden Freddy, but it would prove to be yet another new character. Someone who would be arguably the most important character in the entire series. Also, if you brighten it, there's a 3 in the corner, just in case you couldn't tell. What can we use? Again, just in case you couldn't tell. Here we have a bit of a reveal. This is actually a sequel, not a prequel. The old animatronics are scrapped, forgotten, destroyed. And then, when the image is brightened, a little more of our new character. If I remember correctly, this was around the time people started calling the character salvage or amalgamation, because it was believed to be a combination of different parts. Now there's a quote I recognize, an iconic line that would permeate the series forever. The purple text obviously alludes to Purple Guy and is pretty much a dead giveaway as to who this new character truly was, but we'll save that for later. Here we have a reveal of the camera map we'd see in the game. And if you brighten the image, we can see a new system, what would later be revealed to be the vent system. Another thing to note, if you flip the map upside down, you can see it's very reminiscent of Scott Cawthon's icon. Just a funny little thing. Guess who? Balloon Boy had already been established as a hated character. Not actually hated, just more of a meme because of his annoying laugh and the role in gameplay. And that caused this mix of shock and panic at the fact that he may reappear, especially in this nightmarish appearance. But no, not that yet. When the image is brightened, you can see the number 10. Exactly what this means is still unclear, but theories range from there being 10 nights to 10 characters to a release date. Again, I still don't think we know what this means and the phantoms. While technically Phantom BB was the first reveal, here we have a hint at their incorporation. All in your mind. And then there was the trailer. There was so much surrounding this. From the little things like Bonnie looking at the camera to the iconic line, he will come back, there's even a scene that while creepy now, would actually have some crazy lore relevance. But then there's the jump scare. I think this is around the time people started making the spring trap is a good guy theory because he just sort of walks at you instead of jumping right at the camera. Oh, did I say spring trap? The name reveal for this character is wild. On his Steam community page, Scott Cawthon made a seemingly innocuous post about early beta testing of the game. However, certain letters were doubled up. Selecting these letters and putting them together creates the message, my name is spring trap. Why this was his name was not exactly clear yet, and people still thought that he was an amalgamation between Bonnie and Golden Freddy. I mean, I guess they were half right. And then, the game was released. Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck. Another fun way Scott Cawthon built hype was by completely trolling the community. Early on in the hype of Five Nights at Freddy's 3 in February, Scott Cawthon made a Steam Greenlight post saying that the game was going to be released early because someone had hacked him and released the game on Game Jolt. Downloading the game, however, after this creepy menu screen, would lead you directly into a simple reskin of an old Scott Cawthon game, There Is No Pause Button, which is where Scott got his profile picture, with a Freddy head on. In the background, that classic troll song would play, but that ended up getting changed due to copyright reasons. There was some stuff of actual note in this game, however. For instance, some actual game files were found in the decompile, and a strange number easter egg that many believe is connected to the Balloon Boy 10 teaser in some way. Also of note, the menu music for this game is the actual menu music for the final game, but just slowed down. But then, on March 2nd, 2015, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 was released. This one was really different from the other games. I mean, really different. In one way, I like the concept of this game better than 1 and 2, but on the other hand, it's the only one of the main 4 and sister location that I have yet to beat. 
Seriously, I have no idea what it is that I'm getting wrong, but I can't seem to figure it out. Plus, it's not as engaging as the first two, so I lose motivation pretty fast. But let's just get into it. First, there's only one animatronic, Springtrap. The Phantom slash Hallucinations do act as a part of the gameplay, but there's only one character that can kill you, and that's Springtrap. The first night, Springtrap isn't even in the building yet, according to the lore, so instead you just get accustomed to the office. Starting night two, Springtrap is released into the office, and he can come at you through the vents or from a door on your left. Now, I would go into a gameplay loop, but it isn't quite as simple as the last couple games. Although among players, it is considered easier. In FNAF 1 and 2, the cameras were only used mechanically and not to actually keep track of the animatronics. However, in this game, that's the most important part. Springtrap moves from camera to camera, either in the vents or around the main building. Once you spot him, you can either use an audio cue to lure him somewhere else in the building, or block off a vent, one vent at a time. There are a couple limbo areas, for instance standing outside your office or hanging around outside your door. As far as I remember, if Springtrap is standing in front of your window, you still have a little bit of a chance to lure him away. However, if he's in the doorway, you just sort of have to wait it out or else you'll be jump scared. The Phantoms come in all different shapes and sizes and all have slightly different mechanics. Phantom Balloon Boy appears randomly in the cameras, and if you don't move away from the screen quickly enough, he'll jump scare you. Now, Phantom jump scares don't kill you, instead causing some other havoc, disabling your other systems, but we'll get into that later. Phantom Foxy appears randomly in your office, and if you turn to look at him, he'll jump scare you. Phantom Freddy will appear walking down the hallway in front of you. If you stare at him for too long, he'll jump scare you. Phantom Chica is similar to Balloon Boy, but only appears in the arcade machine on Cam 07. Phantom Mangle appears on the cameras as well, but doesn't jump scare you. Instead, Mangle plays ear-piercing static and stares at you for a while. Phantom Puppet will appear on Camo 8, and will appear in your office if you stare for too long, blocking you from using your camera and maintenance panel for a short period of time. This is where things started to really change from Five Nights at Freddy's 1 and 2. Like FNAF 2, there's no doors, so instead you have to use the defense mechanisms I talked about earlier. Audio lures and blocking vents. However, all of these systems, the video, the audio, the vents, have a counterpart in the maintenance panel. Getting jump scared by a phantom, or if you use one of these aspects too much, it will stop working and you need to move to the maintenance panel to fix it. This takes precious time away from trying to keep Springtrap at bay, and god help you if multiple systems fail at once. This was also the first introduction to an extras and cheats menu. Beating different aspects of the game unlocked a cheats menu, a gallery, a jump scares menu, you could play all the different mini games, and an aggressive mode. However, there was no custom night. Now, on a more personal note, I prefer this idea for gameplay in concept way more than the other ones. Like, actually having to use the camera instead of just flipping it up really quick to wind a music box or check on Foxy. You actually have to keep track of Springtrap. But even though I like it so much, I don't know why it's so hard for me, even though it's supposed to be easier by all accounts. It's not easy being green. This game is not afraid to use entirely moldy greens and like dusty browns. From the stained tile walls to the dilapidated wires and animatronic parts, all of this is intentional of course, but we'll get into that. Despite being set 30 years in the future, things are even more jankier and low tech. Now there's a reason for that, but we'll get into that in a second. For now, let's talk about the cameras, the office, and the characters. The office, much like in Five Nights at Freddy's 2, is a lot less claustrophobic than Five Nights at Freddy's 1. In fact, you have to move all the way to the other side of the office to flip up your maintenance panel from your camera. A window stares right at you, a vent on your right, and a door on your left. A box of animatronic parts sits next to your desk, and a Freddy Fazbear suit sits missing parts on a coat rack outside your door. The art, posters, and even plushies on your desk seem somehow even less cute and more uncanny. Despite the rest of the location being lit by bright green stage lights, your office only has a single hanging bulb, keeping you relatively in the dark. The main thing to note, though, is just how wide the office is. Like I said, you have to move all the way from side to side to access the camera and the maintenance panel. It sets up a perfect feeling of hurried tension as you try to fix a broken vent or reset the audio cue in time to save yourself. In my video about Five Nights at Freddy's 1, I talked about how well that game makes you lean in and try and pick apart everything that happens in the camera. Well, it's very similar in this game for a couple reasons. Firstly, it's the main aspect of the game. 
In later nights of FNAF 1, you don't need to check if Bonnie is in the camera or if Freddy is in the bathroom. It's more of a mechanical gameplay loop, not utilizing the other cameras except Pirate's Cove. But in Five Nights at Freddy's 3, you always need to keep track of Springtrap. The other aspect is how much harder it is to see these cameras. Pure darkness and deep shadows, absurd static, and a character who's the same color as 90% of the map. Actually trying to distinguish Springtrap in the cameras is insanely difficult, which once again means you'll be putting your face right up to the screen, putting yourself in the perfect position to be scared by a phantom animatronic. For the phantoms, I feel very similarly to the characters in the second game. They're cool, but not scary, they're trying too hard, except Chica is kind of creepy. Springtrap, on the other hand... Wow. You know, because of his more goofy animations in this game, his design doesn't reach its full potential. He is one of the best slasher type character designs in video games, maybe even going into movies too. There's a reason there's a huge movement to get Springtrap into Dead by Daylight. This old moldy machine with visible viscera and gore of a human that is fused inside of it, it's amazing. His bloody skull can be seen through the holes in his head and his mouth, destroyed, ripped, and moldy. Unlike the more uncanny animatronics who seem expressionless, Springtrap radiates too much expression. He seems too alive, like a thinking, breathing creature, which, as half corpse and half robot, he has no right being. And that is why Springtrap is one of the best character designs in the game, and he would eventually make his way up there to be iconic like Freddy and the Puppet. There isn't a lot here that I haven't already said about the other games. Drony, eerie ambience, a stinger that happens when things get a little bit too close, loud and human-like jump scare sounds. There are a couple things I want to mention about this game in particular, though. First, the beep 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 of the breaking ventilation. Paired with the visuals of the blinking red lights, this sound creates pure panic. That's really just a large part of the game, inducing panic in between moments of just dread which is what the Sister Location trailer called it. Another thing I want to mention about this game is the glitchiness of the audio. Along with the more janky visual design, which again, is on purpose, the audio sounds crunchy? I don't know audio terms. It feels as if the audio itself is glitching, breaking, unstable. This not only adds to the visual feel of decrepitness, but also to the tension behind the broken down and shoddy electronics you're armed with. Much like in FNAF 2, your means of defense do not feel at all reliable, making you feel much more vulnerable, further increasing the fear. Also, in the Between Night minigames, which we'll get back to, there's this really interesting use of 8-bit sounds and then like real-life background ambience. It makes you feel like you're actually playing one of these arcade games somewhere in an old abandoned building. Also, the two ending songs are some of the best pieces of game music ever. I know I say this a lot, but wow. I mean, if you thought Five Nights at Freddy's 2 was convoluted, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, I'm not a guide for how to beat all the secret mini games and, you know, how to get the good ending, but for now, let's talk about some of the easier stuff and then I'll go over the basics of that sort of thing. So the premise, first off, it takes place over 30 years after the first game. And much like the first game, the story is revealed through phone calls. However, it isn't the classic phone guy who first calls you. It's a new character, dubbed Phone Dude, who has this sort of surfer accent going. He reveals that the location is actually a haunted house attraction based on the rumors surrounding Freddy Fazbear. They've been collecting memorabilia and props from the restaurant. However, due to being so faithful to the original restaurants, the technology you're using, camera, ventilation, is old and janky. The air vents are unreliable and the equipment is a real fire hazard. You are doubling as an actual security guard and as part of the attraction with people walking past and looking into the window to feel like a real Freddy's restaurant. It hasn't quite opened yet though because they're waiting to find something that really hooks people, an animatronic. They even contemplate having you dress up in, and I'm saying this verbatim, a furry suit to jump out and scare people. However, on night two, we found and so Springtrap has been released into the building. Also, replacing the phone calls as nights go on are these vintage training tapes talking about this new Springlock animatronic, narrated by Phone Guy. Springlock animatronics double as both an animatronic and a suit by sort of compressing the animatronic parts out. They operate with spring locks, which keep the animatronic parts out so you can get inside. However, if you were to accidentally trigger one of these, well, you're dead. Now you can start to see what happened to Springtrap. 
They also mention this back room where you're supposed to bleed out if the spring locks go off while you're inside. Okay, so the basic premise. You're a night guard at a horror haunted attraction and an evil zombie robot is after you. In between nights, you play these 8-bit mini games, very similar to the death mini games in Five Nights at Freddy's 2, which reveal a different story. Each night you play as a different animatronic in a leaking, abandoned pizzeria that seems to resemble the FNAF 1 location closest. A shadowy animatronic figure leads you to a back room which you can't enter and then PURPLE GUY, guy attacks, taking the animatronics apart. Finally, on night 5, you play as the crying child, making your way to the back room again and we see Purple Guy seemingly afraid of you and a few other ghost children. You chase him around the room until he gets inside of a Golden Bonnie Springlock suit. However, the suit goes off while he's inside, and boom, he's dead. And now we know that Springtrap is the purple guy. Then we get the bad ending? Also, at the end of Night 6, we learn via a newspaper clipping that Fazbear Fright has burned to the ground. However, Springtrap may have survived the fire. Alright, so I am going to get into how we get the good ending, but first let's go over some smaller easter eggs. Sometimes this poster will turn into a Spring Bonnie poster, and sometimes you'll be able to see Shadow Freddy over on your office, but it doesn't do anything. Sometimes a paper plate doll will appear in your office, and then there's the classic rare screens of the animatronics, including a mobile only one. Okay, wow. Here we go. In the in-between night minigames, there are these hints that you can find around the map. Numbers, symbols. When applied to the game correctly in the actual nights, you can unlock these secret minigames. Clicking hidden cupcakes, pressing on certain buttons on an arcade machine, or, and the most convoluted one, entering a code on your wall tiles as if they were a keypad. Scott, seriously. Seriously, Scott? Oh look, here's Read a wall. Let me just get dial in my phone number. <laughs> Once you enter these minigames, you can just complete them normally and go back to your night. But that's not how you get the good ending. Instead, you have to glitch each minigame, some in the most convoluted ways imaginable, to give cake to some hidden ghost children. Also of note, in these minigames, we can see a glitchy shadow bonnie and a location that is presumably Fredbear's family diner, as referenced in the second game, featuring Golden Freddy and Golden Bonnie, now known as Spring Bonnie. After you've done that, you can play the Happiest Day minigame, where you, as a child in a puppet mask, wander through a pizzeria until you reach one last crying child. All of the other children from the other minigames join you to give them a birthday cake, and then you can get the regular, not bad ending. Wow, there are a lot of theories here, and we'll get into that later, but just for now, the fact that anybody figured these out is insane to me. At this point, there were a couple different ways to view the game. First, it was the most amazing, scariest game ever made, or there were the people who resented it for being made so quickly and relying mostly on jump scares, or at least that's how they saw it. However, the Let's Play scene was at its peak here. Everybody wanted a piece of the action. I mean, with the only game with an actual end, people thought it was going to be the thrilling conclusion to the biggest horror franchise in a long time. Alright, I've mentioned fan songs on here before. This is when DA Games made his Five Nights at Freddy's 3 song. And The Living Tombstone released their only fan song that I didn't like when it came out. To be fair, it has grown on me, but the old SFM models and the chorus turned me into a little Five Nights at Freddy's fan song elitist. Also, Rumi made a Five Nights at Freddy's 3 song? What? To be fair, it does kind of slap, though. There was the fantastic Two Evil Eyes SFM short film. Springtrap really seemed to strike something with people. A serial killer stuck inside of a moldy, disgusting, rusting animatronic. It's a really great character concept. And there were also a lot of hoaxes, or just fan-made leaks in general. The classic SFM, Fazbear Mall, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 trailer, the Freddyland teaser, and of course the hoax screenshots and character reveals. Okay, this was a really interesting time for theories. For all intents and purposes, the main story had been wrapped up at this point. Generally, the consensus on the story was this. Purple Guy, an employee at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, was a serial killer who murdered children at Fazbear Entertainment restaurants. Dressed in a Spring Bonnie costume, he was able to lure children to a back room and kill them. With the help from the puppet, the first victim, the children haunt the animatronics. The puppet helps bring them together, giving the Golden Freddy victim the birthday he never got. Years later, after the franchise has closed, the Purple Man, haunted by the children, goes back to the abandoned restaurant to dismantle the animatronics and get rid of the evidence. 
However, the spirits chase him into this old spring-locked suit, which goes off due to the leaking ceiling tampering with the spring locks. Now dead, the spirits are set free. However, Purple Guy's spirit now haunts the suit, and 30 years later, he's released into the horror attraction Fazbear's Fright, which burns down not long after. Throw in a little cliffhanger at the end that he survived, and you've got a nice bow on the story. There were still some loose ends, but I feel like this is where Five Nights at Freddy's peaked story-wise. There were also some smaller miscellaneous theories. There was the idea that the mangle wasn't actually a phantom and instead a physical animatronic roaming the facility. Or the idea that the blue jeans, green shirt character was somehow integral to the story popularized by 8-Bit Gaming. And the idea that this scene in the trailer is actually the same scene in the minigame, which, if true, would be very gruesome. But still, there were those loose ends. The bite of 87 still wasn't solved. Was the Golden Freddy victim the bite victim, or... Was he killed by the purple man at his birthday party? Who the hell are the shadow animatronics? Or these masks in the Happiest Day minigame? Who started the fire? MatPat's theory made a lot of attempts to cover these. The endoskeletons belong to Golden Freddy. The puppet stuffed the children, not the purple guy. Purple guy used the taser. Phone guy's recordings being out of timeline in FNAF 2. The bite of 87 being the mangle. Jeremy being the bite victim. Phone guy is purple guy. The rain is what kills him in the spring lock suit. The bad ending is canon. And so many other timeline issues. Honestly, it felt nice having some closure. That wouldn't last. Alright, so where does the game go on the tier list? Okay, maybe some people will say this is blasphemy, but judging on the Twitter poll that I put up, I think a lot of you agree with me. I'm putting it in B tier. Remember when I said people thought it was easy? Well, that wasn't necessarily a good thing. A lot of people felt, like, a little disappointed. There wasn't a custom night, it felt like it went by a little too fast, and people thought the gameplay was just lackluster, along with the jump scare. In fact, some people speculate that the reason Scott Cawthon would go on to make a Five Nights at Freddy's 4 was because of how poorly that this game did. It's not that it was terrible, it's just compared to the other two, it doesn't quite hold up gameplay-wise. I might have even put it on C tier if it weren't for the fact that Springtrap was introduced in it, and the story is really amazing in this game. It's just gameplay-wise, it's not great. But I feel like B is a good spot. It's above average. After FNAF 3's release, a new teaser showed up on Scott Games' website with a top hat. And then, it disappeared. And then... Ah! So, there's Five Nights at Freddy's 3. I have to say, writing this made my head hurt. There's so much going on, and...